Hello, homebrewed Christianity listeners. This is Trip. This is Bo. And today, you are about to get debacalicious. And it was debacalish. That's right. This is the uh, audiologically delivered to your smart device version of the great debacle with Tony Jones and Peter Wallace. Just last week, we were in this exact location, the new headquarters of homebrewed Christianity in Torrance, California. Temporary headquarters, probably. But... We got to sit down with Tony asking, did God kill Jesus? And Pete taking the side that Jesus killed God. Uh, It was pretty, pretty zesty and pretty exciting. And Mo has it all edited up so that you can hopefully finish it in less than two hours. But you know, one of the great things about podcasting is you can hit pause and pick it back up where you left it off. And you're going to need to probably because not only is this about a two-hour episode, but it is so chock full. I mean, this is really one of the more rich engagements we've ever done. It was our first experiment with a debacle and it was better than I even imagined. I know. I want, I want to uh, make, say thank you to how many people did we end up having on it? 1300, 1300. How many comments? Like 260. Yeah, that's crazy on there. I also found that there was another place people were commenting and there was more there. And I was like, Oh, Oh, really? I didn't even know they existed. So uh, people tuned in from all over the world, South of the equator on the other side of the planet. For some, it was like 3.30 in the morning. That's dangerous. Yeah. (laughs) So uh, thank you for everyone who participated, tweeted, shared it on Facebook. Um, And now now you have this. You can share with your friends and tell them. And most of all, I want to thank uh, Tony and Pete for participating in this new They're format. They're such good sports. And uh, you make sure you head on over to homebrewedchristianity.com so you can click through and get their books. Um, the the one Divine th- Magician yeah. and Did God Kill Jesus. The one thing I will mention is that if you listen to the Homebrewed Christianity episode from last week with Tony, you talking with Tony from Progressive Youth Ministry Conference, then the first half hour of the debacle is going to seem familiar to you, although Tony does make some points Uh, other than what he had made before. But if that is familiar material to you, I just want to say that Pete's response starts at around 30 minutes in. And for some people, that's when the debacle starts. Debacling. Yeah. The great debacling is going to happen. Um, Before we get started, Bo, I wanted to ask you what you were doing this summer. I am going to summer school. Oh, really? Yeah, we're going to do a high-gravity class in June and July called... Living Options in Christian Theology, and it's going to be in response to Theology for a Nuclear Age. By Gordon Kaufman. Yep. And Sheila Devaney actually has written Theology at the End of Modernity. She was the editor. It's broken into five sections. Each of those five sections has three essays in it, and we, you and I are going to spend the summer interacting with those essays, and every week you're going to pick one essay to focus on, and I'm going to pick another uh, to to make my main presentation with. To make, and we are going to have a hootenanny. That's right. So um, it's going to be a lot of fun. And remember, there are two different ways that you can be a part of the class. Number one, you just go click over, buy the class. You'll get – if you've never taken one, you'll have to fill out something for like a name yeah, on the, cl- like the class page. And you'll be able to sign up, get in the class. It's 30 bucks, six weeks. Uh, the other way is if you are a member of the new Homebrewed Christianity community and you are registered as either an elder or a bishop, then you'll get an email saying, hey, guess what? You're going to get everything from this class. You can join live, uh, the live streaming video times for each session. You'll get the audio from each week delivered to you each week so you can listen, catch up, or uh, whatnot. Um, so the two ways is one, you just pay, take the class. Second, is uh, uh this homebrewed Christianity community page we just started, and uh, which which I'm pretty excited about. Yeah, it's been great to see people's response. One of the things we're trying to do is both Trip and I are in transition. Is we're trying to take the podcast up a notch from a hobby cast that we basically do in our garages. We're gonna uh, put some resources into it, into the technology, into. Uh, where we host it and we've revamped the website. And so this community is going to help us put out a higher quality product more frequently and really excited about the response we're getting so far. Yeah. Like, um, y- y'all don't know this, but like, you know, Bo and I always oh, schedule this interviews to do them. Then we're sitting around and we have no one able, and we can't really pay anyone to help. We can't, uh, make sure we get 
uh, things done in a timely, ordered way. So we're sitting on like 10, 11 interviews. Like at all times. This past week, the Grace Grace's interview came out on Gangnam <laughs> Style, and it's been there for what four months, I five know. months, or something. I sat down with Grace Jisun Kim and Joseph Che back in in November at AAR in San Diego. Terrible. Yeah. So basically, if you go to um, the Homebrew Christianity page and click join the community, uh, it's think of it like. Um, ongoing Kickstarter where you like mm. have different levels yeah. support. So like five dollars a month, you're an acolyte, um, and you'll get invited to all the Google Hangouts of deacons and stuff online. Uh, you'll get private invites to events and conferences, that kind of stuff. But most of all, it's like a way of saying I get to play with fire while listening to the podcast and uh, support it. At ten dollars a month, you're like a deacon. Um, you know, purchasing ecclesiastical titles is fun. And uh, on top of the other stuff, you're going to get uh, shout-outs. You'll be able to leave a shout-out for anyone you want on the speak pipe, and we have to play it, even if Bo has to bleep something or, you know, edit it or whatever. But, like, if you want to call on and give a shout-out to your, your homeboy, uh, uh, Papa Francis, over in Rome, you're allowed to do that. Or your grandmother. Um, uh, most of all, though, you're going to get a pint card, like a theology nerd uh, card that when you have it, and then we're in the same place, I have to buy you a pint and then rant for five minutes about any topic you give me. <laughs> um, Before or after the pint? I, both a- After? Oh, okay. I don't know. Um, and then next level is elder, and elders, it's like pretty sweet because you get to be a part of all, everything we do, live and downloadable streaming, everything. So you'll be in every high-gravity class without paying anything extra, and we have a new class that's going to run all year round um, for elders and bishops. And this is the Epic Reads class. You're pretty excited about this. Oh, yeah. So Philip Clayton and I are going to do it for the first year. Epic Reads is reading Epic Reads from the history of theology and philosophy. So it'll be six different books. One month, I'll do like an intro lecture to the thinker in the book and then answer questions and stuff on the stream. Then the next month, assuming you've read it in the month, we we'll have like a big two to three hour podcast with Philip Clayton and I and other special guests, and y'all will all be on the Google Hangout and can ask questions, and we'll walk through the text, and it'll be a giant nerd like fiesta of awesomeness. Um, and so that means if you're an elder, you get uh, to be a part of that, and then if you're a bishop, like which is pretty hardcore. Um, you get all that plus you get in free to all the all live events. You get, um, uh, you also get invited to the homebrew Christianity soiree, um, and by that I mean we're going to just have a giant barbecue. Nice. Um, and that's a way to basically like hang out with us in the flesh regularly. Uh, you'll get everything delivered to you digitally. You'll be able to stream stuff, and we're going to have some special uh, learning um, extravaganzas here in uh, in LA and around the around the country. And if you're a member of it, you don't pay to go to them at all. Like if other people are paying 200 bucks for a weekend thing, you don't pay. All the all the bishops, wow. they can just walk in because they're a bishop. Yeah, no, I get it. And we have to kiss their ring. <laughs> True. Let me tell you one reason I'm super excited about this high-gravity class this summer. So it starts June 12th. We take a break for 4th of July, and then we wrap up uh, in the end of July. So it's six weeks. But I have noticed that for a lot of people, they love what we talk about. But process, which you're really into, is a little – it's a bridge too far. It's a little bit of a commitment that to make that full conversion to a different metaphysics. So for some people, radical theology, though interesting, just doesn't provide enough constructive – I mean, it doesn't leave you with a faith even worth having. People understand that I'm into practical theology, but for a lot of people, it's just too practical. They still want to talk about big concepts like God, Jesus, the Bible, the church. They want to do some, not secondary reflection, they want to do some primary investigation, and we're going to do that in this class. And so I'm excited because we're going to present this in a way that doesn't require anyone to make a major, they don't have to gut their already existing faith. It is a way to have an, an imaginative, constructive approach to a theology that works in the 21st century. It's going to be a little bit different of an experiment for us and uh, doesn't require them to commit to a completely different framework like process. Uh, well, we'll see because I know John Cobb's in that book. He is in the book. I, <laughs> I, 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 it's I, how I sold it to you. I'm, I'm just calling dibs. <laughs> 
Uh, uh, that chapter, by the way, he try, he he sticks up for realism. Uh, it's pretty good. I, know, I, I I I when I saw the title, I was like, this. I can imagine how this conversation is going to go with Bo. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, it, oh, we're very excited uh, about the high gravity stuff coming up. We're excited about the community page and being uh, more intentional about bringing you better stuff, staying in touch with the committed listeners, and uh, and and well and. Uh, not going in debt during the year to make the podcast. So <clears throat> but we do want to give two shout outs. We want to thank Emily Richardson and Danny Turner. That's right. They, they hit that donate button on the PayPal. And this episode is brought to you by those two. Emily Richardson, Danny Turner, thank you for supporting the podcast. And as we give a shout out for all of the people who are going to listen to this audio of the debacle, we want to just say, can you just lift these two up? in a moment of uh, prayer or thoughtfulness and just gratitude for their support of the show brings you great material like this. Yeah, so boom, shaka, laka, laka. Did you edit out when I say smoochy boochies? I love smoochy boochy in. Okay, that's great. Anyway, here's Peter Rollins and Tony Jones uh, and, and all the homebrew crew hanging out and getting on that great debacle. Uh, prepare yourself. Yep. And what are they supposed to remember when they get done listening to this, Bo? Well, they should probably click over to Old Town Roasting. That was our sponsor that morning. We were drinking coffee. And and we had some delicious beer from the OKC. So if you're listening to this and you're thinking, man, I could use some caffeine, Old Town Roasting, we are so grateful for Sean the Roaster and for Darcy for bringing over some delicious brew. All righty. So um, I was thinking you were going to say the phrase, share the brew. So, Bo, when they get done, um, uh, <laughs> this is what you think they should do. Share the brew. What a great idea. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to The Great Debacle. This is neither a conversation nor a debate. It's a debacle. And if you don't know what a debacle is, there's no need to look it up on the Internet because you're about to experience it right in your screen. First things first. Yes, I have a giant sty in my eye. So <laughs> feel free to ignore it or to make fun of it. Um, but I, it wasn't on purpose. Uh, but I'm sure it's gross. It feels gross. And I'm sorry. Uh, second, uh, we are talking to two of my best friends today. Peter Rollins. Say hi, Pete. Hi, Pete. See? And uh, the, the good Dr. Tony Jones. Hi, Tony. Hey, Trip. Hey, Pete. Hey. Aww. And they both wrote books, and they write more than one book, but these two books are perfectly fitting for the day because there are 365 days in the calendar, but there is only one that Tony Jones and Peter Rollins agree, and it's on Holy Saturday. That's the one day they both agree that God lays dead. So I figured what better time to get debacalish than now, and right underneath the screen, Right beneath us are two amazing links to each of their books. And when you click it, you're saying to yourself, by the end of this, you're like 90 minutes of excitement for completely free. I feel like I should just buy 10 copies of each book. You just click it and you buy it. You give it to all your friends and family. Um, even if you don't ever read it, it's okay. They'll still let you purchase the book. The blessing is in the buying. Oh, the blessing is in the buying. Yeah, so uh, you can do that. And uh, it's, it's, it, it's right there for the Carpe Diem. Of book purchasing. All right. So uh, Holy Saturday is the day where Jesus lays in the ground. And Tony's book, Did God Kill Jesus, wrestles with it as an event in the life of God, as a way of coming to reinterpret sacrifice, as a way of understanding God's relationship to a suffering world and the crosses strewn throughout history. That is what's going on in Tony's book. And in Pete's book, it's like a, a death of God understanding of the cross in the divine magician. You have uh, three moves. And I've even been told this morning after Pete paced back and forth across the backyard for like an hour that uh, he finally uh, understands how to tell the great insight of the book in 15 minutes. So here's the format. Uh, Tony's going to give a 15 minute uh, um, a little mini a mini taster of the book. He's going to tell you about his big thesis around the cross and Holy Saturday. Then uh, Pete's going to do the same. Then I'm going to ask Pete three questions, and Pete's going to answer them briefly. 
because we're going to do it quickly. Then I'm going to ask surprisingly the same questions to Tony. And you're going to have your mind blown and go, they're friends and they have so many similar things in common, yet they answer these three questions in completely different ways. And then I'll ask them both questions at the same time. And you'll see that they share a lot of the same critiques from very different perspectives. And then Jesus is coming back. So uh, that's the uh, um, a plan for today. Uh, any opening thoughts, Dr. Jones? I'm just glad to be here and glad to be sharing this uh, 90 minutes of airtime with you. I think it's I think it's a great idea, and I think it's uh, I, I honestly think it's fascinating how much traction this has gotten and how many people are fired up for this. Opening thoughts, Pete. I'm just concerned that my book is being used as a beer mat. If, uh, <laughs> oh, no, I didn't want to show it. I was just going like, Tony's got this beautiful display of books behind him, and my only book is being used to uh, as, a put coaster. Beer, as a coaster. But uh, I'm very excited to be part of this. You know, yeah, everything's a little bit, a little bit sensitive already. <laughs> already, Pete. So, um, also, uh, the other thing that we're launching today is the Homebrewed Christianity community page. Right between their two books is a little thing that says join the homebrewed Christianity community. So you can click it. You can watch a little YouTube video where you talk about really sweet ways that you can get your own ecclesiastical title because that's what everyone wants in life. I need you to buckle your theological safety belt. Prepare yourself because the one and only Dr. Tony Jones, the ecclesiologist, is about to open the trunk of the church and drop a cross bomb in it and say, like that, but with words in 15 minutes long. All right, Tony, you ready? Yeah, trip. Look, I am, I am thrilled to be here. And, uh, I think I want everybody, you know, all, all the hundreds of people who are tuning in and listening to this and watching this to know that like I, to begin, uh, trip and Pete are two of my very closest friends. And, uh, I have a great deal of respect for Pete's work. I've read everything he's ever written. I'm sure the same people say the same thing. In his prologue about my work, because I'm sure he's read Postmodern Youth Ministry and The Sacred Way, which is like 16 ways to pray in ancient rhythms and things like this. So I wrote this book. Th- this book that I wrote was it was a long time coming. It started with a series of blog posts, mainly because I'm blogging in the progressive Christian space. And I was becoming more and more frustrated with uh, my fellow kind of progressive bloggers um, being afraid to talk about the cross and being afraid to talk about the violence of the cross. And I even heard a lot of people say like, we want a nonviolent atonement. Like the atonement is a nonviolent, um, event in Christianity. And I'm like, well, what do you do with like the bloody dude hanging on the cross? It seems like it's an inherently violent event. And that, that those of us who are center to center left needed to figure out a way to talk about the cross in in ways that were true to the text and uh were also hopeful and and kind of forward leaning so that's that's what i did that's how i started writing the book i i wrote blog posts and then i wrote an ebook the ebook was has done very well and a lot of people liked it a great deal and so um that's why i ended up kind of expanding it into the full bright red book that you see behind me with the with the will at rye. And you can, I'm sure Trip is tweeting out like links of how you can buy my book and Pete's book. And they're, they're on the conversation page for this, this uh, deal. So uh, when, when I dove into the topic of the atonement, one of the first things that I wanted to do was to relativize the primary version of the atonement that kind of most of us in Protestant America grew up with. And we grew up with this version of the atonement that theologians call penal substitutionary atonement and is a terrible name. So I, I renamed like every version of the atonement in my book. And I named this version the payment model of the atonement. And the bottom line of this version or this understanding of Jesus' death on the cross is that we owe God something that we cannot pay. That's the bottom line. Some people call it the satisfaction model. Some people call it the substitution model. Whatever whatever the bottom line is, because we sinned, we can't make it into heaven. We owe God something 
we can't pay it. We don't have enough money in our bank account to pay it, to get ourselves into heaven. Only a sinless, like semi-divine, demiurgish, Jesus-y person could do that. And so sure enough, that demiurgish pe- person shows up in first century Palestine. Then, then he dies on the cross. And, uh, you know, suddenly God's like, oh, now you all have enough money in your bank account. Like, you're good to go. You can come to heaven now. If you sign up for that bank account that Jesus deposited all the money into, if you don't sign up for that bank account, you're still pretty much screwed. You're going to spend an eternity in uh, eternal conscious torment in a lake of fire, which have been prepared by the devil and his angels to quote Jesus and Keith Green. Um, you know, uh, I have a problem with that. I have a real, real problem with that. And it's not a problem that I had when I was a 23 year old youth pastor. I mean, somebody said to me recently, like, could you have written this book, uh, when you were 25? And I know of all the books I've written, I know for sure this is not a book I could have written when I was 25. And there are, there are a couple different reasons for that. And that's, um, that's kind of the basis of, I, I want to talk about the theology of it, but then I actually want to talk about like the existential, um, value of it for me. And I think that ultimately might show kind of, this will be interesting to hear what Pete has to say, but I'll get to that in a second. One, so after talking about the payment model of the atonement and kind of saying, uh, I don't think it's biblical. I don't think it makes any sense. God wouldn't have created us knowing that we would be sinful, knowing that we could uh, never pay God what he expected us to pay. And, and therefore he would have to send his own son. It's like he set up this whole system, this whole economy of salvation, and then threw us into the economy of salvation. And we're not able to like even uh, work in that economy. We have to throw ourselves on the mercy of, of a heavenly banker. And that's Jesus who can, who can take care of this. Okay. So then I, the next thing in the book that happens is I lay out these other versions of the atonement that have kind of been developed over the centuries by different theologians. So um, there's a very early theory is called the victory theory, which a lot of people know because of Greg Boyd, like Greg Boyd, his ministry for a long time was called the Christus Victor dot org or whatever. That was even his website. And it's, um, it's this early version of the atonement that says that, Basically, Satan or evil, evil forces. However, you there are a couple different kind of subversions of it, but the bottom line is Satan holds the world in captivity. When Jesus dies on the cross, he rescues humans, all of humanity and all of creation from the captivity of Satan. Now we live in kind of this um, in-between time, which I, I refer to as like that um, – that World War II soldier who was on some tiny island that was that's part of the Philippines – and like 25 years after World War II was over, they found this guy like he was still standing there with a rifle. The war was over, but he didn't know it. So he was still fighting the war. And that's kind of how the that's where we live right now um, uh, with the victory theory. There's um, another early theory that I call that's like a middle middle ages theory. It's a version of the atonement called the magnet theory developed by Peter Abelard, which says that God it like draws us to God's self in this powerful act of the crucifixion. So Jesus hanging on the cross is an electromagnet. And we see Jesus on the cross and we're so overwhelmed that God would love us this much that we're drawn into God's love and God's kingdom. There's a, like a very new version that I, I, I'm partial to called the mirror theory developed by Rene Girard. And the mirror theory is that when God hangs Jesus on the cross or God hangs on the cross in Jesus, that he's reflecting back to us what our violence always does. Our violence ends in death. It does not solve conflict. It does not reduce our rivalries with one another. It does not relieve the pressure that builds up in society around these rivalries. So Jesus is the last scapegoat or really what he's showing is that scapegoating is a bankrupt system. Sacrifice is a bankrupt system. Um, and then there's 
another version that I'm very partial to called the divinity model of the atonement, which is comes from Eastern Orthodoxy, which says that we each within us have the spark of divinity. That's how God meant us to be. That's how it was supposed to be from the Garden of Eden. And we have, because of Adam and Eve's sin, death has come into us and we've lost touch with that inner divinity. But Jesus came to like reignite that divine spark and that divine flame within us. So those are the ones I lay out in the book. I also talk about um, some uh, black theology of James Cone and some feminist theology and some Asian American theology uh, that deals with this idea of Han. So there's, there's other theories also that, that are dealt with in the book. One of the things for me that I had to grapple with and that I was not particularly, um, I guess I was not particularly attuned to as a Christian uh, believer going into this study of the atonement was how sacrifice really worked in the Hebrew scripture. I will say that I think like a lot of Christians, I kind of glossed over the sacrifice part. And I, I, I came to grips with the fact that I needed to understand sacrifice if I was going to understand the death of Jesus because Paul makes such a big deal out of it. And the gospel writers do too. They see in Jesus' death kind of a completion of the sacrificial system of the Hebrew people. And a lot of my friends, um, they really, I, I've heard a lot of people say that the sacrifice of the, of the Hebrew scripture is just like a misunderstanding of God. God never wanted these sacrifices. God never wanted blood. Blood doesn't make God happy. And so, um, Jesus came along to kind of be like, Hey, people, wake up. We never, God doesn't want your sacrifices. God never wanted your sacrifices. My problem with this is I think it's ultimately anti Jewish or anti Semitic. It, it's called supersessionism. And that is that we've kind of jumped over the Hebrew scripture. And even the book of Hebrews does this. And it, I think it's problematic and it's anti Jewish. So I wanted to come up with an under a progressive understanding of the atonement that understood the Hebrew scripture and the Hebrew sacrificial system as something that is beautiful. And it was, was commanded by God and it was used by God and by God's people um, for many centuries, many generations. So uh, the bottom line then theologically for me was I, I went, this is the, this is the most exciting part for trip. I'm sure I went a little bit in the process uh, avenue for, um, understanding God and God, God's existence through the Hebrew scripture and into the life of Jesus. And that's this, that God is learning along the way that God is learning in God's relationship with humanity through the sacrificial system, learning that that doesn't work, learning that it doesn't work for God or for people, and ultimately God um, becoming fully invested in humanity in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, coming to uh, live those you know those years of life with in Jesus of Nazareth, experiencing everything that humanity experiences, and. Um, so having kind of said what happens in the book, I want to step back just for a second and say something about where I think Pete and I, it, it's one of the, here's where I think what's going on with Pete and me in, in our understandings of, of the crucifixion. It's almost like, you know, sometimes when you like, um, you talk to a super, super liberal person politically and you talk to a libertarian politically and you're like, you two are like almost where the circle reconnects, right? You're that close. You're like closer than a traditional Democrat or a traditional Republican on that circle. Like the libertarian and the uber liberal are super close. And I think Pete and I are probably there when we talk about the crucifixion as either uh, like I think I'm, I'm trying to say the crucifixion is the single most meaningful event that's ever taken place in the history of the cosmos. 
And I think what I'm guessing what we're going to hear Pete say is that the crucifixion is the end of meaning or the crucifixion tears open the truth that there is no meaning. So I think we're close on that in that we see that event as singular in the history of creation. And I'm going to say it's singular in the history of the life of God in that God was so invested in God's relationship with humanity that God became and encased in flesh, lived through these years and went all the way to death on the, on the cross. So there's, there's one, I'm going to do something that I I don't know if Pete's going to do. I'm going to read the Bible, baby. Shout out Harper Collins. Shout out. Um, there's one text. There are two texts that are quoted multiple times in my book. One is what I'll end with, but the other is this quoted three different times in, in full. And it's this very familiar passage from Paul writing to the Philippians, um, this hymn or poem. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Paul, like Paul sees this event as the the most important event in the life of God, in the history of God. I similarly think that, and I will tell you the one other passage that I think is, um, I think is the single most important verse in all of the Bible. And that's where Jesus cries from the cross in the gospel of Mark, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because if you follow me with this idea that God is fully in Jesus and God is experiencing humanity in its fullness, then God experiences the absence of God. God experiences forsakenness. God experiences existential loneliness. Now, I've made a choice. I've made a choice to, to that my vocation is as a Christian theologian. So I am working within the bounds of Christian orthodoxy. And I'm, you know, at times when I'm saying things like God is learning, God is progressing through history with us. I'm, I know I'm pushing up against the boundaries of Christian orthodoxy, but ultimately I'm not consumed with questions of, is there a big other? Does God exist? Although personally, that is a question that vexes me, but my calling, I think my vocation is, to do work within Christian theology that gives people meaning. So here's, this is, this is where I want to close. I think probably a lot of people who are watching this for sure, um, uh, Trip and Pete and some of the other people who are in, uh, in the room there in Southern California, they, they know that, um, I have existentially had a difficult last six months. There's been a lot of things that have happened in my life that have been hard. And I'm not the hardest things that have ever happened to anybody, but some of the hardest things that have ever happened to me personally in my, in my life, in my family, in my career and things like that. It's been a great comfort for me to think, to believe, to place my trust in the event of the crucifixion as the most meaningful event. The cry of dereliction, my God, why have you forsaken me? The experience of forsakenness that even God has, that Jesus had in that moment on the cross. That, I think, brings meaning uh, to the death of Jesus uh, and God's participation in that, um, in that event, in that moment, that brings me an extraordinary amount of comfort and solace. And I think um, if there is any event that has meaning, this is it, the crucifixion. Thanks. Well, there you go. Uh, the doctor, Tony Jones, uh, did God kill Jesus? The link to the book's right below you. And um, one of the things that, that, uh, I really liked about your book, and I figured in each transition I'll try to say something about 
how much I like each of your books, is that uh, you do the first uh, clearly articulated account of the suffering of Jesus as being a problem not for uh, understanding the person of Jesus. For most of church history, the cross and that cry of dereliction was, well, how can the human Jesus say, God, why have you forsaken me in the gospel of Mark and nothing else and die existentially abandoned by the one he used to call Abba but can't mutter anymore? And they would try to figure out how the divinity somehow didn't participate with that. And Moltmann, in very large books, and this year at AAR, we're celebrating the 40th anniversary of the crucified God, yep. where uh, we'll be talking to him at the Homebrew Christianity podcast in November in AAR for the party the Fortress is throwing. Anyway, um, but in that book, he takes 400 and some brilliant pages to just say, look, church, the question isn't how do you manage to get around the deity at the cross? But how does the deity embrace and is transformed by the cross? And it includes uh, the father's relationship to the son as he dies, God abandoned, the son's experience of abandonment and death, and the unity between them uh, through the life of the spirit. And I love Moltmann, and I've given books of Moltmann to people who go, I'll trust you that it's good. Um, but I've had multiple people after saying, no, 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 Tony actually wrote something that's legible about that thing I tried to talk about. And, and they've all appreciated it. So I'm very excited about the book. If for no other reason than you did something I've been trying to do for a long time and even Moltmann couldn't figure out how to do is articulate his beautiful thesis in a compelling way uh, about the cross at the heart of the Trinity, which is a perfect good reason to go get it. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Um, so now as we go to uh, talking to Pete, um, I just want you all to know that there are – Already 11 different people have signed up for the homebrew community at $285 a month is the total of the pledges. And um, I was talking with Pete last night, and I was like, look, if by the end of this thing uh, we get over $1,000, then I'm going to let him shave my stash. <laughs> um, not my beard, my stash. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so anyway, um, Peter Rollins has written many books. I've read them. And this is the first one where when I read it, I was like, Pete, like, I actually considered agreeing with you for a whole like 30 minutes, wow. multiple times in the book. I mean, normally I think of Pete as like my favorite person to disagree with. And uh, we became friends because we would be at conferences speaking together and realize we were the only ones that read things like Badu and Zizek and Deleuze. And we'll sit there and talk about it. And then he'll be like, I can't believe you're like a real Christian and, and read these books. And I'm like, I can't believe, you know, Jesus and go all the way with this and blah, blah, blah. And like, you know, friendship by argument. Well, um, I have developed not only a respect for uh, Pete's mind, not only a uh, love for him as a human being, but I've actually decided he's above average as a writer because in the divine <laughs> magician he even he even tugged at my heartstrings and i said well if i ever give up on everything that's good true and beautiful in christian theology this is my adjacent possible and um yeah so here you go mr peter rollins doctor um that's high praise indeed trip that you think i'm an above average writer can I put that on my next book? <laughs> as long as I get to put, if I had to believe any of this, I would agree with Trip. Yes. Okay. okay. You can have that in the back of the book. Yeah, it's great to be part of this. Um, yeah, um, great to be debating with uh, Tony Jones, who we, this is the second time we've done this. Tony um, debated the crucifixion. I think a couple of years ago in New York City, we did something similar. I, I, I do want to take a obviously slightly different slant. Um, I want to offer a reading of the crucifixion that is a critique of the more orthodox or confessional uh, uh, approaches that Tony outlined uh, in their conservative, liberal and progressive form. And in order to start, uh, I think it'd be useful to start with a story from back in Belfast when I was growing up. Uh, one of the techniques during the troubles of the IRA was to plant an incendiary device in like a shopping center or a swimming pool area and then they would phone up the police and they'd say listen there's a bomb in the area you've got five minutes to get everybody out and so there was a story going around uh, heard in school in which this guy uh, Seamus uh, dies 
and he goes up to heaven and he's waiting at the pearly gates. And eventually St. Peter comes out with this dusty old book, opens it up, looks in it and says, listen, Seamus, you're not you're not in the book of life. Right. You're in the IRA. You've got to go downstairs. Right. And Seamus says, oh, he says, no, you misunderstand. You misunderstand. He says, I'm not trying to get in. You got five minutes to get out. Right. Now, this is, I think, getting to the heart of the subversive message of Christianity and of the cross, that there is a fundamental transformation in the internal mapping of our idea of the absolute, not as something out there that we get to, but rather resituating the absolute in the world. And this, I think, captures the subversive heart of incarnation, crucifixion and resurrection. So first of all, what do I mean when I talk about God? Very briefly, uh, I'm talking about a sovereign. Uh, that which justifies uh, the world and the systems of what's right and what's wrong, political systems, cultural systems, religious systems. In many ways, God functions as the uh, supreme being who orders the universe, um, who has everything in place. There's that famous, although actually not well known, verse from uh, All Things Bright and Beautiful, which says, uh, uh, the rich man at his castle, the poor man at his gate, God made them high and lowly and ordered their estate. Um, so this is God as that which justifies meaning. Well, one of the things I want to say, by the way, is, is this is not simply a secular notion uh, or a religious notion. that This idea of God functions even after someone stops believing in God. Our Tad DeLay uh, just wrote a book called God is Unconscious which looks at the Lacanian reading of theology. Uh, what you'll find in this, the idea that uh, whenever God dies as an intellectual thing that you grasp, God still remains as an unconscious phenomenon. So take the example of a child who has grown up uh, wanting to please her father. This is an example Tad uses. Uh, she uh, picks a career that her dad would like. Uh, she picks a partner that she thinks her dad would approve of. And then at a certain point, her father dies. Now, with the death, does this girl suddenly become free from trying to please her father? Right. And the answer is obviously no. Uh, although the father is dead and she knows it, she knows her father is, is no more. Still, she feels that she has to somehow please him. Right. Uh, in fact, not only does the father still remain alive in a certain way, the father is even stronger than before. Uh, and, and what has to happen for that person is they have to not simply realize that their father is dead, but that internal image of the father has to realize that the father is dead. That father has to encounter his own death in the subject. So this happens in the psychoanalysis. That's why Lacan says, uh, if God does not exist, everything is permissible which is a, is a play on that phrase that Dostoevsky wrote through a character, which says, if God does not exist, then nothing is permissible, or then, then everything is permissible. Um, Lacan say no, when God dies, God remains at an unconscious level, still controlling what's right and what's wrong, um, what we can do and what we shouldn't do. If you've seen the film Training Day, uh, you see this in action. In Training Day, you have this cop who's a hardened narcotics guy, and he takes on uh, this new person to train him for a day. Now, what we discover is we discover that although, of course, this is a, the police force who are out there to arrest criminals and keep law and order. The truth is there's so much stuff going on under the surface, corruption, stealing, violence, uh, financial extortion. Um, but it's never said. So you've got the system of what what should be done. And then you've got what shouldn't be done, the excellent, you know, Police shouldn't be doing violence. They shouldn't be stealing money. And then you've got this whole pile of acceptably unacceptable practices that are happening underneath. You know, as long as nobody talks about it, the police can do all of these activities, but it can't be talked about. And this gets us to the idea of the sovereign. The sovereign doesn't simply tell us what you can do and what you can't do. The sovereign also, with a nod and a wink, says there's some things you can do, but just never talk about them. Keep them quiet. This is why uh, Shizek interprets that verse in the Bible which says, you shall have no other gods before me, very literally. He says, God is literally saying, you, can have, you shall have no other gods before me. Just like a father might say, you're not going to get drunk in front of me. Right? You, you can get drunk discreetly 
go, go, go get drunk with your friends, but don't do it in public. Don't do it where I can see it. Don't do it under this house. So God is saying, of course, you can have other gods, you know, consumerism and, and, and family and all of that. But on Sunday, when you come to church to play the game, you know, don't, don't do it in front of me. Be discreet about it. Okay. So that's, that's the sovereign. Now, what I want to argue is, yes, that God killed Jesus. God is killed by the system of who's in and who's out. God is not, Jesus does not play the game. Just like in Training Day, the character who Ethan Hawke is playing doesn't, can't be integrated into the acceptable transgression, won't play the game, and so they have to try to sacrifice him. In the same way, Christ is not integrated into the sovereign system, political, religious, cultural system of the day, is always bringing up the stuff that shouldn't be talked about. And therefore, the system has to crucify him, has to get rid of him. So in, in a way, God, God kills Jesus, the sovereign God, the religious God. But interesting in Christianity, then, we identify with Christ as God. So we identify not with the sovereign that kills Jesus. We identify with, with the one who is killed by the sovereign the one who is excluded, the one who is on the outside. On the cross, we say that is where God is. And the cross is very specific. Uh, When you are crucified, you're no longer a citizen. You were, you know, not, you were not under the regime of the political. You were not seen as uh, a subject. You were, you were stripped naked. You were stripped bare of your identity and you were cursed of God. You were no longer under the frame of, of religion. It was the point of being a complete outsider, completely reduced to nothingness within the system, within the sovereign system that, that, that defines who is in and who is out. So the Christian identifies um, with Christ and participates then in that um, abject destitution. This dark, the nihilistic core of Christianity is the moment when the Christian identifies with this subtraction, Alan Badur, the philosopher called it, the subtraction from the system as it is. But it's more than that. Uh, Also, Christ, God, who we identify with, experiences the loss of God. So earlier I said about how it's not just the father who has to die for the child. Also, the father has to experience the death of the father internally. We identify then with a sovereign God who experiences a, a, a separation from, from that God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This cry on the cross. And what I try to argue is that this opens up a radically different notion of how to live and how to understand God and the sacred, which is that now God is not some object above the world that controls things, that, tell, that justifies wars and, and, and political systems and economic systems. Um, God is found in the dissident community of activists who try to, and who identify with the least, with the outside, whatever the system says is the outsider, identifies with the outsider, sees them as the site of salvation, gives oneself to the world. This theologically is called the epoch of the Holy Ghost. Now God is virtualized in the collective of people who love one another, who look out for their neighbor, who try to materially transform the world in love. So this is a move from God as sovereign. God kills Jesus, but Jesus kills God. By identifying with Christ, we experience this abject negation of sovereignty. We identify with the one who is the outsider. Uh, We have solidarity with the outsider. And we come to understand Christianity as a way of materially living in the world, finding meaning in in the act of love. Now, I want to just briefly finish with how this relates practically. It was my experience, actually, when I was 17 years old. I had a conversion of sorts. I had that moment where everything changed uh, outside our uh, church. And three things happened. It wasn't an experience. It wasn't I didn't break down. I didn't, you know, feel something inside a fire or anything like that. Uh, in a sense, nothing happened. And yet everything that organized my life seemed to fall away. I came home as a 17 year old and I said to my parents, I'm not your son anymore. I'm not part of your family, which is quite traumatic for them, you know, but I'm, I'm, 
and and then I threw away the stuff that I had in my bedroom. There wasn't much there. I got rid of it. And I stopped going to tech where I was doing a computer studies course. Now, now reflecting back on that and going, like, what was actually going on in my head? Why did I respond in that kind of way? Well, what I would say is that I was under the power of a God, a God that I didn't believe in, but that regulated my activities. That, that my political leanings, my religious cultures, all of that. So I was secular. I didn't believe in God, but actually God continued to function um, in a way with controlling what I what I did, who I could hang out with, what I was going to do with my life. And when I said to my parents, I'm not part of your family anymore, I think in a very crude and cruel way, I was trying to articulate that all of the principles that, that regulated my life the, the things that I was growing up to believe in, many of these things were good, but they just didn't have operative power. And when I got rid of my stuff, it wasn't like this big act of sacrifice. It was like these were aspirational things. You could tell what I valued by looking at my property. And I just didn't feel controlled by those values anymore and got rid of them. And again, tech was the thing that I felt I had to do, going to doing a computer studies course, settling down. That was the, the track that I was on. All of this fell away. I experienced not simply the death of the sovereign because I didn't believe in the sovereign. I didn't believe there was any overarching big other controlling my life, but it still was controlling my life. What I experienced is that the sovereign itself experienced its death internally, remapping me um, so that I could, you know, hopefully kind of live uh, in a more grounded way without the oppression of this big other. Now, of course, there's lots of reversals. I got into a very conservative community, and but it also inspired me um, to try to start to look at what what might a community of the Holy Ghost look like? A community not defined by belief, theism, or atheism, or not defined by certain political and religious ideologies, but in a sense, an illegal community, a community outside the legality of the sovereign, um, a community that is not that is always dislocating which is always subverting um, any system that says Jew, Gentile, slave, free, male, female, theist, atheist, conservative, liberal, problematizing these divisions, uh, problematizing anything that says this is just the way it is, the rich man at his castle, the poor man at his gate. Uh, always identify in solidarity with the absolute outsider and seeing them as the place of the transformation of the world. So, that's my answer. Did Jesus kill God or did God kill Jesus? All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> Trip, a couple things from the online. All right. Number online. one, Pete, um, Tony would like you to drink more. He thinks you're too coherent. Ooh, wow. Yeah. Wow. He's, I think, you think he's shaking. Oh, his no, this is there. convenient. Well, I like this. Our sponsor, <laughs> who Bell Works in Oklahoma, has a beer called Do Not Resuscitate. <laughs> Um, DNR. This would be a Belgian Golden Strong. It may or may not be 10% alcohol. That would be a high gravity beverage. And what I have found is that this is an appropriate thing for discussing God with Pete because when I said to Pete, I was like, what does your Easter morning prayer look like? And he said, what? And I was like, yeah, 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 on Easter morning. When I say like he is risen, what do you say back? And he goes, DNR. And I'm like, no, 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 like, you know, like it's a liturgical experience. Like um, he has risen. You say he's risen indeed. And Pete's like, no, no, do not resuscitate because, Pete, you're against the big other making a comeback after. Look at this transition. I just it, it, admire it's totally it. totally made up story, but it's good. Oh, because <laughs> we know who never makes up stories. Yeah. Peter Rollins. Seamus is, is real. Yeah. Seamus, is, <laughs> Seamus is, is real. Uh, never mind. I'm not going I love introduce you to Seamus one day. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, not as much as Elgin, but um, <laughs> uh, but so here's here's the question. Uh, when uh, we were having a conversation the other day, and that you said part of your concern around Christians trying to then fit the event of the cross back into uh, this notion of like sacrificial system atonement and these questions that the Hebrew people had was that. We then are putting this event back in the very system it was call, calling into question. So could you say briefly, because I'm asking you and Tony basically the same three questions, how do you understand the Christ event and its relationship to 
uh, the, the sacrificial system, that imagery, that desire, that scapegoating mechanism. Yeah, um, absolutely. My, this is my concern with the traditional ways of understanding both the ones that exist and the ones that can exist. Because you, you heard with Tony, you know, he mentioned the kind of the five big ones. And then he also started to list off lots of other ones that are around. There's no end to how we can reinscribe meaning into the crucifixion. There will be no end. And in 50 years, there'll be 20 more different interpretations of how to reinscribe this event into meaning. It's that very activity that I think the cross resists. That's a, that's a domestication of the abject horror of the crucifixion. The crucifixion for me, I explore this in the Divine Magician, operates like Shoah uh, within Jewish thought. That the idea that Shoah can be, or can be uh, rendered or brought into a system of meaning. Oh, the Jews were all mur- murdered in Nazi Germany because it was a trial by fire, by God. Um, it was a holy sacrifice, a holocaust, a, a holy sacrifice, or it was because the, the, the people of God uh, sinned. All of these theodicies, these attempts at apologetics, these attempts to, to put the, the Shoah into a system of meaning, defy the fact that it's a rupture in meaning. It tears up our, our, our systems of sovereignty. It, it exists as a, as, a, as a thorn in the side, as a bone in the throat. Just as World War I operates really for European intellectuals, again, as that which cannot be integrated. Uh, or with, with Job, you see the same thing. So my argument is any attempt to place the crucifixion into a system of metaphysical meaning, um, it go, actually betrays the, the event that we're to participate in, the experience of the loss of meaning. So when you hear the death cry of Jesus, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? One of the things your books share in common is an insistence that this cry is not one that you understand if you put it back in to those other last words of Jesus that are in the other gospels that not that there's not something gained by watching the one dying cross dead, forgive the people that are doing it, but that you don't get the weight of my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If you explain it away by putting it into this, high Christological context and miss the material existential reckoning that uh, Jesus was dealing with. Yes, and, and, and key is it's, it's, the, it's Christianity's critique of secularism. This is what my main interest is in, actually. It's the critique of, I live in L.A., very secular place. It's incredibly religious, you know. Um, God has died intellectually, but God remains in New Age spiritual practices and drug use and consumerism and desires for fame. God remains... And much more strongly than you find in religious circles. Uh, there's, there's this prohibition. Everyone has to be fit and healthy and attractive and, and, and work out. And there's so many prohibitions, so many demands that this sovereign that nobody believes in continues to enact in their being. The critique of Christianity, of secularism, is not that God dies, but that one experiences God understanding that God dies. God experiences the loss of God. This is incredibly subversive. Yeah. So what what would you say um, is accomplished at the cross? How are things different or what's the problem the cross is addressing? Yeah. So this is a move from the sacred as an object that we love, a sacred as an object that we can grasp or that we can that, that, that regulates our lives to the sacred as the depth and density of life that we discover in the act of love itself. So it's from the sacred as an object that we love to the sacred as the depth we find in love, when we love. Right? That, so there's a fundamental transformation in how we internally map the absolute. And, and what I mean by that is post-crucifixion, you experience these notions of God's where you love, you know God. Uh, or uh, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am. Or we are the body of God. All of these elements. And in, in the Divine Magician, very quickly, but I look at Christianity as a magic trick with three parts. And just as a disappearing act has the, what's called the pledge, an object. And for me, Christianity's object is the sacred object, the idol, the thing that you think will make you whole and complete. Then the magic trick has the turn, the disappearance of that object. And then the prestige, which is the return. 
but it's, it's never quite what you think you're getting, what you think you lost. Like the coin that I make disappear, the, the, the coin that I make reappear is one that I hid earlier, you know. For me, the, the Eucharist has the pledge. Here's the sacred as an object that you can touch, taste, see, you know, you can reach out and feel it. Then there's the turn, the disappearance in our body, it's gone. And then the prestige is the return when we're waiting and waiting. And then we get up and we talk to the people to our right and to our left, and we see if they're in struggling and if they need help. And we realize that that is the prestige, that we have now gone from a sovereign notion of belief-oriented, kind of doctrinal religion, to a place where faith is um, what could be called sublimation, is what you find meaning in just in, 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 the, in the beauty and dirt of life and grime of life itself. Why should I buy Tony Jones' book? Oh. Yeah, well, I mean, Tony has done an amazing job in the book. It's beautifully written. Um, like, it's it's conversational but not patronizing. It's 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 smart but not doesn't lose you academically, but it doesn't dumb down. It's a beautiful reflection of how you know the different ways of interpreting the crucifixion have have existed over time. So it gives you a real sense of how the church has has thought about it. Because interestingly, the church has never had an official. Uh, uh, kind of like a, what do you call it, official stance on what the crucifixion means. We, we think it does, but actually no, there is no council saying this is what it means. So we can look at these various ways of understanding. Um, I am sympathetic to a certain degree um, to what Tony is saying when he says there's a change in God from sympathy towards humans to empathy. You know, God changes. Uh, Slavoj Žižek in The Puppet and the Dwarf he uh, he looks at how, in a sense, we think of the eternal entering the temporal as a descent. The eternal is the best thing, and then God descends, the eternal descends into the temporal and the mucky and the awful. But, you know, he, he postulates that actually this could be an ascent, that actually eternity is a trap. Is a prison. It's all potentiality. It's nothing actual. It doesn't. It's just. It's a horrible place of eternity, and that's why some of the ancient Greeks said, you know, God. It's not that we are jealous of the gods. The gods are jealous of us. They would like to know what it is to to experience loss, so that they know what it is to have something. They would love to know what it is to potentially die, so that they might know what it is to live. And so, uh, the idea is actually uh, the eternal entering the temporal is an ascent. And that there is, although Tony wouldn't say this, but if I push Tony's argument in, in the direction that I would like, um, it's he's saying that there's actually this um, ascent, this transformation in the absolute uh, that is signaled by the cross. And if, if I'm going to have to be confessional, then I find that that is a, a really interesting approach. All right. So, Dr. Jones, Bo is going to give us some update on this microphone real quick about some really cool uh, just come right there Bo. Uh, right. no oh, hold on i have to switch this oh hey everybody Bo. So want, hey so i just wanted to say we have a thousand people watching which is fantastic what? from all over the world uh oh australia on the continent england manitoba all over canada yeah, north really? america it's fantastic so okay. there's people all over thousand people there's 400 people in the comments section. We're over 120 comments, and a really interesting conversation is just broken out about uh, Christian communities where there is no connection to. Uh, this is by Exile Child to the to the, the divine. And uh, Tony responded, and it has set off a great conversation. So if anybody wants to jump on there, come and. All right, and and uh, and and I just got a message that said uh, that, that that we're like 20 people or 10 people who sign up at the uh, elder level, which means they get all the high gravity classes and the epic to read class, which is like a 12 month reading epic reads from the history of religion and philosophy with me and Philip Clayton for the next year. Then I have to shave my stash and preach sunrise service with the <laughs> most pale piece of skin. Could I, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Son. Okay. Philippians 4.13, Mohawk, here I come. Oh, don't say that unless you mean it, because it could happen. It, I, it, obviously, I'm a person of the possible. Well, okay. I'm, I'm not some, like, person of the actual. Now, Tony, um, I, I had no idea Pete was going to sell your book so well. 
And um, it's always good when one of your friends is like, you know, if I was going to believe anything, I'd agree with you. I feel like that's one of the broadly, broadly. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'd have to make a few changes, but yeah. Uh, what I was going to ask you, sacrifice. Um, <laughs> that is because <laughs> um, I, when okay, you you made the point in the conversation. You made it in the world's greatest interview you've ever had about this book at homebrewchristianity.com. Not biased, just honest. And um, and and you said like, look, I have a rabbi friend, and I wanted for him not to think I'm just like. Uh, just going, oh, that was nice. I'm a little new age Marcionite in the postmodern world and I'm dismissing sacrifice. But um, what then, how do you take your notion of sacrifice, which is spelled out wonderfully in this book everyone's purchasing, and and answer some of the contemporary criticisms of sacrifice? I know you've taught at United Theological Seminary recently. I've taught at Claremont. I know that even if a famous feminist theologian tries to articulate that sacrifice is not a completely dead end theologically, that there is a challenge. But sacrifice sets up a divinely sanctioned model for abuse. So how did you articulate sacrifice and embrace this tradition, this conversation, and also recognize the liberationist protest against some of its perverted implementations um, in the life of the church? You know, like you, um, when I move, I move in, um, more progressive Protestant circles for the most part. And, um, you know, it's the, the violence of the Hebrew scripture is troubling and problematic for a lot of people who are in that stream of Christianity. And I hear a lot of things about, um, people saying, uh, you know, oh, the God of the Old Testament is, this God of wrath and the God of the New Testament is the God of love. And obviously Marcion, uh, in the very early, like one of the very earliest, uh, iterations of Christianity was to say, these are two different gods that these two testaments are talking about. Yahweh of the Hebrew scripture is a demiurge, a lower God. The, the father of Jesus, the father to whom Jesus prayed is the, uh, is the, you know, the God of Plato, this like perfect immaterial being. And uh, we should not get the two confused. And the way we're going to do this is by cutting out the bad stuff out of, out of scripture. Um, this, you know, this is a betrayal of Paul who considered it incredibly important to um, build a bridge between kind of what I would, what I call in the book proto Judaism, because it really wasn't Judaism in the, in the second temple period, but like a proto Judaism or the, the religion of the Hebrews, he built a bridge between that and like the, his, his epiphany in meeting the risen Lord Jesus. And like, he has this, like, it seems to me that, G, that Paul's primary hermeneutic is like, is Jesus is Lord. Like that's his hermeneutical lens. And then he's trying to figure out the whole thing through that. So I have this, um, I have this story in the book. It's not nearly as sexy as a Peter Rollins story, but it actually happened. That's the difference. (laughs) Um, is that, um, I was in, uh, Malaysia in Kuala Lumpur meeting with some pastors and, uh, these were pastors of India. There are two different types of Christians in Malaysia. There's, people of Indian descent and people of Chinese descent. And they kind of don't even like, they don't even mix. Like there's a, like there's like a Methodist synod of Chinese churches and a Methodist synod of Indian churches. And um, I was with Indian pastors and I asked them, you know, when you or your, um, parents or your grandparents left Hinduism, like what did you bring with you from Hinduism into your Christianity? And they said, nothing, absolutely nothing, because Hinduism is demonic. We won't even let our people from our church go to a Hindu temple with their family because demons live there. So they have completely cut themselves off and severed themselves from uh, the tradition of their ancestors, the, the religion of their ancestors, when they put on the cloak of this new religion of Christianity. And um, 
what's what's one of the things that's very intriguing to me about the Bible is that Paul did not do that. Like Paul, Paul was overwhelmed with this sense that he had to make sense of uh, the what was happening in the Hebrew Scripture and the God of of the Israelites. And who that God is in the person of Jesus, particularly in the death and um, resurrection of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So when you hear the cry of dereliction, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? How do you understand uh, that event um, in the divine life? How what does it mean for God, for Jesus and for us? Yeah, again, this is one of those places where I think like Pete and I on the circle are like, like full circle almost. It's um, like why Rand Paul and Elizabeth Warren both hate uh, certain types of economic privileging of multinational companies and the destruction of the poor and the planet. That if those two were in charge, then we'd probably regulate massive economic institutions so that they weren't death dealing structures. And you and Pete are just against death dealing structures running rampant through the church on behalf of the resurrected Christ. Yes. Yeah. That, that's, I mean, that, that like Rand Paul, Elizabeth Warren, politically is exactly what I think it is. It's the north south line versus a like left right. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, if, if, in, in, if Pete says the, I, I agree with Pete wholeheartedly in when he says that there. that's fine <laughs> that's beats the yeah. ringtone right there he's just gonna clip that in garage band and make it his ringtone <laughs> um in that um in some ways it is you you might say it is the death of all meaning for sure what the crucifixion of jesus does and i think what we see symbolically happen in like the temple veil is is rent open is that it it exposes um, it exposes the corruption of the political regimes in the material world. Like mm -hmm. that's it, it exposes that in a way that has obviously captured the imagination uh, of billions of people over two thousand years. And I think in in the cycle in the cycles that the Christian Church lives, like there are times in those cycles when we are more attuned to the crucifixions uh, unveiling of the hypocrisies of material kingdoms and other times the crucifixion is used as like a, you know, the, a glorified um, way of uh, I, I have this line in my book where like um, sadly the cross fits perfectly on a military shield you know, and it's been used that way. And I think um, uh, the, the the use of empires and political regimes that, th that they've made of the crucifixion is a terrible sin against the actual moment of humility in the life of God that is the crucifixion. So like where Pete and I get part is that I think – um, in the in the crucifixion, God is doing something, right, that displays the bankruptcy of violence and the bankruptcy of these imperial systems, and shows that the way of life, like, like the way of God's life, is a way of humility. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I, four years ago, you and I sat and interviewed with James Ryan Parker, who's right there. Buddy, we did. Um, 40 different oh, yeah. uh, theologians who teach systematic theology at mainline Protestant um, seminaries. And we took 10 questions that were voted on by the Holmberg Christianity deacons, people on your website, and we let them pick four of the 10 to answer in three minutes or less. Surprisingly, the Christian theologians who are tenured to teach ordained ministers who serve communion uh, administer baptism, do funerals, weddings, exegete the scriptures through the liturgical calendar all year long. Um, their least popular question was, what did God do for us in Christ that we couldn't do for ourselves? Mm. Now, I know everyone probably just burped up a little bit and are worried, 
and their in their indigestions acting up that Christian theologians couldn't answer. What did God do in Christ that for us, for us, it shouldn't be hard, at least for the Protestants, um, that we couldn't do for ourselves. They just blew conniptions, didn't even pick it. The ones that did were like, what do you mean by do? <laughs> and uh, and they, no straight answers. You have a rather large book for it. So if if uh, if today uh, with a little less hair on top, but a more beautiful smile, I was to ask you. Um, wh- like how are things different after the cross? What did God do for us? We couldn't do for ourselves. Uh, after the project of this book, what, what are you going to say? And I, I'd say this is the most speculative part of my book at the end. And it's the one that I find, I find the most exciting and the most challenging and hopeful. And that's the question of what happens as a result of the cross. So, you know, the, all, all of those theories of the atonement that, that I mentioned and that Pete said there are going to be 20 more 10 years from now um, are all trying to answer that question. Like, so what's, what's different? What's the point? Like who cares? What does it even do? What, ma- what change does it make? And um, I'm making this rather unorthodox claim or a claim that's going to um, be discomforting for uh some, for people who've been schooled in this um, understanding that God is the same yesterday and today and forever, and God never changes, God is immutable, God never, you know, God never grieves, um, God has no emotion, to say that there, a change took place in the actual life of God, like a change took place in the Trinitarian Godhead as a result of the crucifixion. And I'm not, I, you know, I'm not... Um, naive enough to think that God is some metaphysical being who's like up and we're down, you know, this kind of thing. I I think that um, God lives and moves uh, within us and throughout us. But I do think that the life of Jesus of Nazareth was singular and unique and that God was invested in that, in that life. And um, so you know, what's incredible to me after the crucifixion is even even like the little Pentecost of John, when Jesus sees his um, followers after the crucifi- after the resurrection, and he just blows on them. Like in Acts, we get the big like the tongues of fire and the and the speaking in tongues and the, and Peter preaching and 3000 come to faith. But the Pentecost of John is just Jesus breathes on the disciples and, and, and says like, um, here's this, here's the spirit, the spirit that empowered me during my life. And then, you know, that's only a few days after he had earlier said, um, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. So Jesus makes this promise, goes through the passion and then comes back and breathes the spirit on his people. And I think that the promise is that um, God and humanity are now united for, from a, for, for all, e- e- I wouldn't say eternity, but for all, like for all ages, God and humanity are united in a way that they previously weren't. So it, cha- it makes a change. The crucifixion I'm proposing makes a change in God and makes a change in us. All right. All right. Well, now I have a, a, a few questions. And I, I was reading through your books and, and thinking about, well, you know, like, I just want to bring the people together. They, they've heard very different articulations. They found out that you are close together on the north south axis, but not the left right one. And, um, but there are a couple places where you agree. And so, uh, whoever, you know, moves first, I'll put your screen up, you answer, and the other one can add on or whatnot. Um, but, uh, I, the first question, why is Christianity so tempted to ignore the cross for the glory of the resurrection? Okay. I'll say something. Um, you know, for me, it's not Christianity. It's us as human beings. I mean, if the crucifixion is this, uh, traumatic death of sovereignty of the, uh, the big other who regulates our existence, that is a very traumatic thing. That's not traumatic for Christians. That's traumatic for humans. 
Um, it's something we want to avoid. Uh, this nihilistic kind of moment, this dark, desolate experience where we lose the thing that we think uh, regulates, uh, justifies our lives or the idol that we think will make us whole and complete, um, which is the way I explore it in other books, The Idolatry of God, is where I look at this as 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 the death of the idol. Whatever you think it is, money, fame, uh, religion, right? and whatever you think the, the, that which will make you complete is, it's that death. So very short answer is simply, uh, the crucifixion is not a, it's not that something that Christians want to avoid. It's something that we as human beings want to, but we do want to die before we live. We want to live, but we, but the path to life is, is as an idea that we have to enter into a profound death, um, is, is deeply traumatic. Um, it requires, I mean, everything, the whole of secular society is, is designed to stop us from doing that. You know, from movies we watch, TV programs, kind of hedonism, everything is designed to kind of get us away from this idea that we need to give something up um, and, and start to learn to live with our lack and, uh, and start to live by taking responsibility for what we believe in our actions. So. Mm-hmm. Tony, any, uh, what, is, uh, what is it that Christianity is tempted to ignore um, when, it, when it just dwells on the glory I think there are two things uh, that that come to mind. One is that uh, I think, like I agree with Pete again, that they that there's um, there is a triumphalist kind of sentiment or nature that we all have. Like we want to be triumphant and we want to skip over the suffering. And I, and um, I think that in probably earlier eras of the world people were much more attuned to suffering. I mean, you can read all sorts of things about like how, um, how many dead bodies people, a, a human being would see in the middle ages, so many dead bodies and they only lived to be like 40 and how few dead bodies we see today. Like, you know what I'm saying? Um, people, we just try to clean up and, and like bracket out, suffering and death out of our world and try to like keep it all pretty and clean. Um, and, uh, I think that also, so that's kind of one of the negative things I'd say on the positive side, a lot of Christians, particularly those that are pro- progressive people want there to be a nonviolent world. Like that's what people want. They want, yeah. they want Christianity to be a religion of peace. And they want us to be uh, people of peace. And it's and so for progressives who want to be people of peace, who preach peace and practice a religion of peace, a um, like a religion that's founded on a, a horrifically violent event is is like really difficult to reconcile. And so a lot of preachers and just a lot of like everyday um, believers who are progressive would rather just avoid the bloody dude hanging on the cross and just like jump straight to the empty tomb. Like you hear that a lot. Like, why don't we just have empty tombs hanging from our necks? Like we should have an empty tomb necklace, not a cross necklace. And <laughs> that, that's like a kind of a common thing that I hear. So um, what does Christianity without the cross end up perverting? Because I've had conversations with both of you separately about certain individuals who have managed to articulate the faith in a very attractive and compelling way, but you would not know from the bulk of their their work and preaching and writing that there was a cross involved. And I feel that there's a um, a, a real temptation uh, for us as Christians to articulate Christianity without a cross because it's just so much more palatable. But when we do, what is it that we are leaving out? Yeah. Um, you know, very briefly, he, again, because we don't want to, you know, we want to go for the Joel Osteen kind of everything's great without going into the, the suffering and the brokenness. Um, that's, that's something we all want. I'm not critical of it. I want that. I don't want to have to go into some sort of death. But, uh, you know, in, in the type of work that I'm exploring is, that's the only way to start to enter into this idea of 
getting rid of the death that is within life. Because for me, religion is not about the death that comes at the end of biological life. That's that's neither here nor there. You know, it's about experiencing a depth and density in the life that you live now. If you could live forever, but you couldn't experience the depth of your life, that wouldn't be a blessing. If I could give you that, if I could touch you in the forehead and you would live forever, but you couldn't experience the depth of your life, you'd be swearing at me. It would be a curse, not a blessing. So for me, it's like, you know, how do you get to a form of life within death? Or, you know, a life which is not not marked by a despair. And in philosophy, you know, there is, that's what existentialism does. Existentialism is, is the great thinkers like Nietzsche and Kierkegaard who come in and say, you know, the path to affirmation is, is, has, has a darkness and a nihilism as part of it. In therapy, it's psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis is a therapy that's, a, that's very untherapeutic. If you're going to get someone to pat you on the shoulder and say it's all going to be all right, the psychoanalyst isn't going to do that. They're going to take you to the darkest places. Um, and in Christianity, there is kind of red letter Christianity, which is the sayings of Jesus, all of the great moral teachings or the great kind of ways of living that makes you a slightly nicer person um, in your daily life. That's all very well and good. But um, a, a theology of the cross is one that, that demands a rupturing of of ourselves and of our political and religious and cultural affirmations. It's a, it's a dark and dangerous thing. And um, what's the promise at the end of it? You know, it's the promise that we're going to be happy and complete. No, you might be killed for it. You might be crucified for it. It might be, it might end up in disaster. You might lose the people who are nearest and dearest to you. You might lose your job. I know loads of people who have lost their jobs and religion because of this, you know, because they take Christianity seriously. Um, you know, it's, it's, but it's a way potentially where you'll be able to sleep well at night and you'll be able to say, I lived fully and completely not necessarily happily but um you live before you died mm -hmm. so one one of the questions i had and, and i want you both to answer it because it was a theme in both your books and we haven't talked a whole lot about it i've seen some tweets about it is how is the cross a threat or judgment of our kind of human regimes of power politics empire that when we have Christianity without a cross, we're also depoliticizing so much of the gospel. But more than that, that the cross itself as an image of power um, subverted, it, that, that when we neuter the gospel of the cross, we're actually uh, defanging the good news to take on empire, to take on uh, political and oppressive systems and that selfish drive for human power within us. You know, the first thing is, I think that any, any religious system, be it a theistic system or non-theistic system needs to deal with suffering. I think Pete's work deals with that a great deal. Um, I think that increasingly my work more than it has in the past is probably dealing with that because I think that uh, common to the human experience is an experience of suffering and uh religions that are purely triumphalistic i think are extraordinarily shallow and will not meet that kind of that felt human need that we all have that we suffer and that we want some kind of answer for our suffering and the answer for our suffering could be the um the answer could be what i'm proposing that your suffering is meaningful because it's wrapped up into the divine life of God. And like God in the crucifixion embraces human suffering and brings it into God's self. And that we're not alone in that we're swept up into the life of God. Or it could be that what suffering really does is reveals the, the actual meaninglessness of suffering, which is like the way of, of the Buddha that like you, when you can, ex when you can fully embrace that suffering yourself, you realize the meaninglessness of it. And that's actually the road to, to, you know, enlightenment and nirvana. And I think, you know, there's some kind of prior resonance with there with Pete going in through the psychoanalytic vein of like how you, I mean, much of psychoanalysis, right. Especially in the way that Pete engages that work is um, coming to terms with your own suffering, like, and being able to 
find meaning in that or articulating that or finding the meaninglessness in that, but like coming to terms and coming to grips with that. So to take that from the personal level and expand it out trip to your question of like, what are the political ramifications of that? I think um, in, in so many ways, a lot of the suffering that many human beings endure is the result of political systems is the result of when people get together, bad shit happens, it hurts people, and many people suffer as a result of political systems that um, hierarchicalize um, or develop a caste system where if you have power, a great many don't have power, the great many suffer, and they look for meaning in their suffering. And of course, this was, this is Freud's great criticism of religion, right? Is that religion tells people it's okay to suffer and therefore it, um, you know, it like gives more power to the bourgeoisie because they're defining that suffering as part and parcel of what God wants you to do. And this is deeply problematic. So that's a misunderstanding, I think, of crucifixion and a misunderstanding of what uh, crucifixion of Jesus says about suffering in these political systems. Well, okay. So the Bow Daddy who's been monitoring the hundreds of comments and stuff is going to come take my chair to be the voice of the people for questions. Uh, you explained to us how the cross is a threat and judgment of human power, politics, empire, and all of the like. For me, the, the, the crucifixion is a deeply political act deeply political. So the, the cross was uh, a symbol of, as I say, you're no longer a citizen, you're outside the regime of the political structure, you're cursed of God, you're not a human being. So to be crucified was to be stripped of everything. It was a symbol of power, it was a symbol of authority, it was a symbol of the punishment of hell. This was hell, this was like, if you do not obey the system, or if you don't play along with the system, uh, then this is what's going to happen to you. And what you see in Christianity then is the adoption of this very symbol of sovereign power, of, of, of suffering, of hell, reappropriated uh, and says, no, God is not that which justifies the, the cross. God is that which dies on the cross. God is not the guarantor of the legal system. God is the illegal dissident um, who is crucified by it. This radically transforms how we think of of, of, of life. The, the outsider is no longer the problem that we need to get rid of. The, the outsider is the site of salvation. Um, now, so take a very simple example. Take, you know, because I want to, you know, it's all abstract, it's great, but what does this mean practically? Well, take the prison system in America. If you think the prison system is, you know, and it's racism and the violence and, you know, how it, terms of uh, people who are economically deprived or there, you know, the, the prison system is seen as the problem. We get, you know, it's, it's the problem we need to solve. We go in there, we try and make it better. But actually, what if the prison system is not the problem? It's the solution to a problem. If there's a problem within our society of racism and violence and, and, and economic disparity, and the solution to that problem is the prison system, where we put certain people away, we regulate their activity, we, we do all of that. Now, this changes things because if I think that the, the, the problem is the homelessness or the problem is the, 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 the prisoners, um, then I can come in and I'm, I'm good news to them. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going out and bringing good news to the homeless population by giving them a blanket. I'm bringing good news to the prisoners by going and visiting them. No, this, this problematizes that because then I'm great. I am the site of salvation for the other. I feel great about myself. What if the truly traumatic thing is that the homeless population expose a problem within my system, my structure, the, the, the whole sovereign system that I participate in? And I go to them not to save them, but to be saved by them. That the very thing that is counted as nothing, say the homeless population, they're the nothing. And we, we can go out there and we can kind of try and help out a little bit, but they're not counted by the system. But we go out there and precisely to experience the good news, to hear the good news, to see that we've got problems with uh, lack of education, uh, lack of jobs, lack of mental health provision, uh, wars. I mean, you meet homeless people all the time who are veterans, you know, so it's like 
the, the, this is the, the problem within our system of violence and war that produces a solution. Okay, stick them, they're homeless, and then we can kind of make sure they all hang out in this area, and we can police them, and we can make sure that things don't change. But actually, if we go to that population and we understand why it exists, it is traumatic for us because it problematizes us but ultimately it might be the side of a positive transformation of society itself. So for me, the crucifixion is interesting, the appropriation of the very symbol of sovereignty. If you don't obey, you know, this is what happens to you. If you don't, if you're not part of this, then, then you're the complete outsider. And it appropriates that as, okay, you, you're the inside. That's why in a sense for me, hell is exactly the place of salvation. So whenever whenever religious Christianity says the complete outsider is, say, the atheist or whatever, you go, and where would Christ be? Well, Christ would be there. And this is actually Holy Saturday. This is the day when Christ is in hell, in the place of the absolute outsider. So that's the political move of Christianity for me, is that the, the collective of Christians is the subversive cells that are... that. Um, can be described as living in the epoch of the Holy Ghost. These cells of resistance, of illegal dissidents, who destabilize the secular order and the religious order, always on behalf of the complete outsider. But the complete outsider, who we think is the problem, is actually the solution to the problem, the site of salvation and transformation. All right. I love that voice. Let's hear, big, Daddy. let's hear a big deep laugh. The, or, the, <laughs> or the big other, as I'm known sometimes yeah. <laughs> when, when, when Jack Caputo's around. That's crazy, is that what they call you? That's yeah, the, I know. I, you are, you're the big other for Trip. I am Trip's, I am Trip's big other. I, I, I watch over him. <laughs> I keep him. Bo, yeah, B-O. B-O. It's, B-O. it works, it works. Hey, so listen, there are 1,200 people watching this. There are over 200 comments. There are 340 people who have logged in to uh, register the comments should they feel led to do so. But I have two that I really uh, stood out to me. So the first one is for you, Tony. It's a question about uh, your claim of a Girard and then your later claim of supersessionism. And somebody wants to know how you think Girard would uh, answer that. Do you think that he would just say it's a demythologizing, like a progressive understanding what do you think Gerard would do with the claim of uh, supersessionism and, and, and trying to be careful with that? Yeah. So, in, in, yeah, I think the question is that in my book, I accuse Gerard of kind of a, a benign supersessionism. Here's the thing about Gerard. Like Gerard says repeatedly that he's not a theologian. He's not talking about God. It's not a theistic account of the Jesus narrative. He is an anthropologist. So as an anthropologist, I don't think he has any problem saying, and he says clearly, like, the, the Israelites are on a trajectory. They're on a trajectory away from their neighbors who practice human sacrifice, child sacrifice. They take it a step. They're like, move the ball down the field by practicing animal sacrifice. And not only do they practice animal sacrifice, but they practice it in a way where prophets are even speaking against it. And you can even follow that trajectory of like um, Cain and Abel, like the very, the primordial sacrifices of like Cain and Abel. And then Noah gets out of the boat and sacrifices and God, you know, smelled the, the burned flesh and he had smelled good to the Lord. And then you get to the end of the Hebrew scripture and you've got prophets saying like, God doesn't, God doesn't give a shit if you sacrifice. God wants you to obey. Like that's what matters is that you obey. So this is Gerard saying this, but God's not involved in the story as Gerard tells it. it it's, it's, it's a story written from a, the human perspective and that the humans are evolving and they're understanding God better and, and it's a trajectory. So I don't necessarily disregard that. But as a theologian, like I'm interested in that in in the multiple times in the Hebrew scripture where God says, I want that blood sacrifice. I want the flesh to be torn. I want the blood to be sprinkled on the altar. So if you're looking at it purely from an 
uh, anthropological point of view, that's not very troubling. But if you're looking at it from a theological point of view and going like, I'm taking those, like they're, they're basically the, they, you could call those like the red letters of the Old Testament. God said it. So as a theologian, I have to deal with it. I want to deal with it. I can't just say, Oh, that's just a primitive tribal understanding of Yahweh, the primitive tribal God. Of the Hebrews. I'm not going to say that. This is why I basically, for those, those chapters, I like submitted myself to a rabbi, repeatedly met with him, repeatedly had him read revision after revision of those chapters to say, am I being anti-Semitic? Like, this is your religion. Th- th- these are your people. And so, um, I, I don't, I think, I think, um, how, how would Gerard respond to my accusation that he's being kind of a benign supersessionist? I think he might say, I'm an anthropologist. You're a theologian. Like, I'm <laughs> coming at this from below. You're coming at this from above. Like, we're kind of answering down, right? two different questions. That, 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 <laughs> that maybe is how he would respond. All right, Pete, the question for you is uh, on this idea of the big other that – this claim that uh, the death of God or uh, is not the death of a transcendent, but the death of our projection. And people want to hear you talk about uh, that idea that it's the death of our understanding or however you would phrase that, but not the death of some transcendent other. Mm-hmm. So that that's the, the question that keeps coming up. People want to hear you talk about. Okay. So it, like what type of existence does the big other have? Is that, Kind of the question or is, is the death that we experience and read about, uh, on the cross, the death of our understanding of a previous God? Like, are we, is it an evolutionary thing or are we talking about a transcendent being when you're talking about that? Like you talk about, uh, the Nietzschean uh, death of God and you played on that a little bit, but people want to hear you talk more about it. Okay. I mean, so if I get it right, there's something for back. Was a big influence in my thinking, and Feuerbach's kind of like a seen as a quite a transitionary figure in philosophy. He's not really studied in a huge way. He's seen as kind of like bridging the gap between uh, you know Hegel and Marx. Uh, very influential in Marx, but you know, didn't exactly you know blow up. But uh, but I've always found him very interesting. And you know, at one point Feuerbach you know addresses the theologians who say. You know, for about every time you talk about God and you talk about theology, you know, you're talking about some very human things. God is above our understanding. God is above our ability to grasp. You know, we are talking about something that that, that is that is un, unable to be spoken. So when we talk about love and justice and mercy and we talk about God, we're always talking about less than God. Right? Now, you know, I've been partial to mysticism and you know, my first book is very much exploring that. But Feuerbach's answer is very interesting. Feuerbach doesn't go, oh, no, I don't believe in the God beyond the characteristics of God. He says, I just can't talk about that. I go like, you know, and, and not only that, it's the most interesting thing about theology are the things that we can talk about. It's love, mercy, justice, or whatever. So, so in some respects, when I'm talking about God, I'm trying to talk about how we as human beings use that word, how that word operates, uh, how it comes into being, how it functions. Because in some respects, that's the most interesting bit. When you, when you start to, you know, stripping everything away in terms of a kind of a, a negative, uh, apophatic theology, you strip everything away, you can end up losing all of the most fun things about theology. And that's what Hegel understood. Hegel understood that the most interesting stuff about theology is how theology is lived. So when I talk about God and the death of God, you know, I'm very much talking about how that functions as, you know, in us and in our communities. And I'm always wary of anybody who then goes, yes, but then outside of the fishbowl that we're in, you know, the Kantian fishbowl of the before itself, outside of the fishbowl, then there's this other God. Which, you know, I, I think happens even with, you know, uh, Tony, um, is that because the problem is you then start. So you kind of so somebody says, oh, yeah, well, the God you're critiquing isn't the real God. The real God is X. So, for example, 
you know, God doesn't really dislike gay and lesbian people, right? That was wrong. I mean, the church thought that for a long time, but the church was just wrong, just like it was wrong about women, just like it was wrong about black people. It's whatever. It's just wrong. Oh, okay. But, oh, but we're right about gay people having to enter into monogamous relationships for life. We're definitely right about that. Right? We're definitely right. So we can welcome the gay and lesbian people into our churches as long as they do monogamous marriage relationships for life. Oh, my goodness. If those crazy people come in and they start thinking that because they've been excluded from monogamy for so many years and they find other ways of doing relationships. Oh, the idea that that might teach us something. Oh, no, 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 we're definitely right. We've got all these other things wrong, but we're definitely right about monogamy. We're definitely right about that, right? This, the problem for me is, is that everybody does the game. Everybody does the game of, yes, you're talking about the God of human construction. I'm talking about the God beyond human construction. And then when you talk to that person about their God of beyond human construction, it starts to look very much like a human construction. So what happens when we just kind of like go, okay, there's no way out of that fishbowl. And, and and then I think it enters into a much more interesting, what could be called immanentist uh, theology, which is kind of what I'm doing. I don't know if that answers the question at all. Oh, I, I think so. And it gives me an opportunity to say thank you to some people, people that are already signed up for the homebrew community. Okay, well, just yeah, one. Don't, don't, I'm going to get bored. I'm going to ask you one more question. Look, God's dead. What do we have to worry about right now? Let me, Pete, I just want to jump in and say to those of you who are, to the 1200 people who are watching this, I, I want to give my, like, my strongest plea I can give that you support homebrew Christianity, even, even at like, even at the five, even at the acolyte level at five bucks a month, because <laughs> I'm not, this, this, what Trip does, along with Bo and me and Pete and Barry and Mickey and all the people he, who have been part of the community of homebrew Christianity over the years, for, for people like Pete and me who are trying to do theology, there is just, I can tell you and Pete can tell you like, um, okay, so, uh, I, there, there was like a, uh, there's a public radio, uh, station in Dallas. And they've had me on in the past two times on their radio show for an entire hour long interview and one time on their TV show for a 15 minute interview. And, um, like my, my book with like a major Harper Collins comes out and they reach out to this radio show and say, Hey, you've had Tony on a couple of times before you should have Tony on again to talk about this new book. The response back was, we don't do religion anymore. Because the the latest times that we've had any religious authors on are, this is on like public radio. This is like thoughtful public radio, hour long interview with Colin. All we get is hate mail from the left and the right. So we're just not going to do religion anymore. So for those of us who are interested in a conversation about faith, religion, sacred text, meaning, God, there are very few venues to do this. and. Um, I just want to encourage people who appreciate this, what we're doing today and all the, and culture cast TNT and homebrew Christianity to like join the community, be a part of it and, um, you know, support trip Bo and all their work. Oh, I'm, <laughs> no, no, don't minimize it. Pete, have you ever seen Tony be nice to someone? But like, <laughs> that was like a minute and a half solid. That's why I'm crying. It's not because of the Hooper stuff. It's like, oh, he's, he has a heart. <laughs> no. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> oh. Oh, we said it was a debacle. <laughs> oh, so, so what's our closing? I have a closing question. And it's only going to be one question, Ooh. and I'm going to attempt to do what I rarely do, is ask a question in under five minutes and expect Bo to edit <laughs> it into a 60-second question. Trip. Hashtag. Too soon. It's, it's live. No. <laughs> but, but, but my preface does not count as part of my time. <laughs> Here we go. I, I, that's different. Um, all right. Here's the question. Um, if you both – were to to go into like a hot tub time machine, <laughs> and and you were to find yourself in a hot tub, 
with the 18 year old version of yourself and you were to talk to the 18 year old version of yourself on Holy Saturday. And they're like, so what's the big deal tomorrow? What's going on? What's all this passion week junk about? I want you to, I want you to look straight in the camera and without too many tears, Pete, tell itty bitty Petey back in Ireland, 18 year old version of you, which I assume has like a few more strands of hair, but about the same size. Um, uh, tell, tell him having a new Pentecostal fresh experience, what he's going to learn in the next 20 years since you just turned 38 and, um, years old. Okay. Hot tub time machine. That was the time machine noise. Professional. I, I honestly, the honest answer is I would want him to teach me because that 18 year old Pete was a militant. Um, you know, he was, you know, committed to trying to change the world. He was committed to doing whatever it took. And, you know, I kind of sometimes think, oh, if this is the Middle Ages, I'd be dead now and it'd be great because, you know, I was okay, you know, for the first 10 or so years. Of pre- and, but then you kind of start to slow down and you have to, you have to keep yourself going. You need people around you to, to keep you true to yourself. So I would, um, I would be wanting my 18 year old self to keep me true to myself. Of course, there might be a few naive edges I would want to kind of like, you know, talk to the guy about, but ultimately I would want him to teach me. But if you were going to explore what a militant for truth looks like, you would sign up for the high gravity class <laughs> where we're discussing Paul and yeah, th- yeah, because that's what a militant looks like signing up for an online course. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, or buy the books. Don't buy the books. Don't sign up for anything. Just oh, the the world, you know? oh my God. That if that he all of a sudden turned into a youth minister, um, <laughs> author of progressive youth ministry, Tony, when you when you enter this hot tub that somehow takes you back in time to talk to congregationalist senior in high school, Tony Jones, and uh, who's who's been an acolyte before, um, who's feeling the tug tug for Jesus on your heart, <laughs> what are you going to tell him? Uh, I actually was an acolyte on Christmas Eve. I had to light about 50 candles at the, for the, for the, uh, midnight, uh, service on Christmas Eve. Here's what I would say to the 18 year old Tony in the hot tub time machine. Step away from the Josh McDowell book. <laughs> Put down more than a carpenter. <laughs> it's not, it doesn't, the, 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 the arguments about whether Jesus was resuscitated and how many Roman soldiers it would have taken to roll away the stone are irrelevant and immaterial <laughs> to the truth of the crucifixion and the resurrection. That's, I, I, I mean, at 18, as a senior in high school, I was giving seminars at church summer camp that I was taking straight out of more than a carpenter of evidence uh, that demands a verdict and reasons to believe and things like this. That, that was my vintage with Josh McDowell. And, and I remember people telling me even at that time, look, it doesn't matter if it actually happened or not. The mat, the truth of the matter is this, or the, you know, the, the truth is the spirit of it, this kind of thing. And while I still to this day, like you, Trip, like I actually think shit happened on that day. Like I actually think materially that shit happened and went down in the, in, in a human being named Jesus of Nazareth and in the life of God. In the end, in, in some ways, it, it doesn't actually matter that much to me what actually happened. Or I would even say it this way. It doesn't matter that much to me if God exists. It matters mostly to me that God exists in Jesus in that moment in time. Like that is what fills me with hope. And if I could even put a splinter of doubt in that 18 year old's head about the, the importance of one actual thing happening or another actual thing happening, I think I would have saved 
that 18 year old Tony a lot of grief in the hot tub time machine. Amen. Mm-hmm. Amen. It, and it, here's what just popped into my head when you said that. There's still 1,300 people on here right now. Whoa. And if you want to, if you want to, uh, find out the, the hot tub. school that many books. <laughs> <laughs> look, look, when you give things away, like the great debacle, then, or eternal life. Uh, but here's what I thought about when you were, you were going to straight evidence that demands a verdict of the hot tub. Number one, never bring Josh McDowell up when your tops are off. It's a life lesson I learned early on <laughs> that if you're in a hot tub and you're 18, there's no reason you should demand a verdict about anything because, well, there are a bunch of variables. Um, but see, I'm self-editing for both sakes. Thank you. Second, um, I have forty to 50,000 words that are coming out in November um, uh, in the Homebrew Christianity Guide to Jesus. And the subtitle is Liar, Lunatic Lord, or Just Freaking Awesome. And I can't stand the stinking evidence that demands a verdict notion of the Easter story. And then this week I had to cry an extra tear, not just at C.S. Lewis, who's a wonderful author and a horrible theologian, um, uh, ruin, uh, like people like Josh McDowell, William Lane Craig and, and the like, but Bono repeated this crap. Bono, you would think that, uh, he had evolved a little bit, but apparently he's been, uh, spending too much time with the one campaign and the power of the one has overcome the multiplicity. And now he wants to impose either or decisions, uh, on the world. And, and he's like, well, you know, either Jesus is who he said he was, which no freaking sane biblical scholar ever thinks Jesus self identified himself as the second person of the Trinity. Whoops. Or he's just insane and pulled the greatest hoax of all time. This is what I hope happens at no churches tomorrow morning. The human beings who decide to attend the collection of people looking for hope after the conquering of sin, law and death, that somehow they get cornered by a person in authority with a 20 to 40 minute monologue given your tradition to then tell you that you have a trilemma. You can either agree with me and I call that Lord. Don't blame me. I'm just agreeing with God, the Bible and everything is good, true, beautiful and holy. Or you're saying that Jesus is a liar or he's freaking crazy. I think that's like just it's bat nuts. But here's the thing. Liberals are all like, no, no, we'll add the fourth volume legend, which is just boring as hell. So that's why I'm trying to bring back the fifth option. It's like uh, Battlestar Galactica. You know what I'm talking about? The fifth. Yeah. Yes. And it's just freaking awesome. This is an ontological title. I have recently discovered that Irenaeus and Athanasius may have pioneered. That may not be correct at all, but nonetheless, it's trying to articulate a category applied to the cross dead Jesus who reveals the divine life of God, who in which in this cross dead Jesus, you encounter yourself as known and loved by God and which is kind of freaky because it's a dead homeless Jew you're talking about. But it's also freaking awesome because what's true about you in God's eternal word, despite the no's and protests and oppressions that we put upon ourselves and others is actually true, not just about you. It's about your neighbor. It's about your enemy. And that's why it's freaking awesome and i just hope no one takes bono seriously about anything except for the fact that he still hasn't found what he's looking for but in november when my book comes out i'm sure he will um anyway so with the time we have left we have a couple things to do uh we just want to say to don adami and so we just want to say thank you don uh second thing is for the all of those who have decided to support the homebrew christianity community by being an acolyte a deacon, an elder, or a bishop, we want to say thank you and that we are grateful for the support and all of the support that comes in will help us put out better podcasts with better technology. It's going to be fantastic as we upgrade our technology. We're excited about that. And I just wanted to update you that Dan Scott Robb has been keeping a tab on points scored Ooh, throughout the entire debacle. So how is uh, Team Pete, Tony looking? Pete has five. Tony has four. Ah! He has one for if you're feeling the tug tug of a hot tub time machine. So we need to, in the two minutes we have left, we need to give Tony a chance to equal the no, score. No, I won fans in there. I'd be reading my dispensational truth. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. how many points do you lose for pulling out a 
a uh, a chart. <laughs> this gives me all the answers. <laughs> We said this would be a debacle, hey, and it has been. You no, know, I, I won fair and square. I it, can't believe I only won There's two minutes left. I can't he, believe I won that He could knock you out in the last round. That's it. Three uh, more. Um, so, uh, so, Tony, <laughs> nine yes. seconds. Team Tony's looking at least for a tie because everything that's good about Trinitarian Orthodox Christianity and the fleshly resurrection of Jesus is counting on whatever the hell you're about to say. <laughs> Don't disappoint them, or even Pope Francis will cry. Look, n- nihilism is always, uh, you know, the is is always popular among young urban hipsters. And as <laughs> as, as I as I asked Pete, w- one of the very first times I met him. Uh, my response, I was responding to something he was, a lecture he was giving at Yale years ago. And I said, like, how would this play in the person, with the person you're standing next to at the checkout line at Walmart? And, uh, I, that's still my question to Peter Rollins today. When he goes to Ikea later today to have his meatball, uh, and lingonberry dinner. <laughs> Yeah, because because I didn't develop in Northern Ireland as a way of dealing with real conflict situations. It was just an abstract <laughs> thing that was in the university. Oh, I forgot about that. Just to clarify what Twitter has. <laughs> that's the answer right there. Yeah, that's the answer. I have no idea what to do with that. All right. Uh, thank you for joining us. If you listen to this and signed up and junk, you're going to get an email where you can download the edited version. Um, you'll only uh, get it right there, and then you'll be able to share with any and all of your friends who are cool. The uncool friends you can share it with if you think God may or may not care about them. Uh, last but not least, um, if you're saying to yourself, how would I get a copy of something really sweet like this, The Dispensational Truth? You can't. It's out of print. Do you know what is in print? Tony Jones and Peter Rollins' book. And when you get it, you may find that there are charts about the end of the world in it. And by that, may or may not, I mean probably not. But buying it nonetheless is awesome. Uh, last thing, I want to thank Coop Bell Works. You know, I know why? Because even though they made a beer called Do Not Resuscitate, I'm eschatologically optimistic that God's going to bring the heat tomorrow. That sin, law, and death aren't going to conquer the junk that God brings in Jesus. That the no's of the world are going to find out that the yes, the resurrected Christ, are just about to rupture that junk. And that um, the Trinitarian life of God is about to embrace all that is oppressing us and bring us into sweet liberation. We are about to experience again the exodus in the face of nihilism into the excessive embrace of the God who gives. Um, Tony... Thank you for hanging out with us all the way uh, across in some other time zone. Hey guys, love you all. And you know what? Um, we maybe we should make this a holy Saturday tradition. Ooh, a tradition of holy Saturday. Thank you all for your support. We look forward to seeing you online. We love interacting with you. Go to the speak pipe. Let us know what you thought about this. Homebrewchristianity.com. Come support the community as we grow and expand this podcast to bring you better and better sounding uh, podcasts. We love interacting with you. We'll see you soon. Smoochie boochies.